continuing with our, our walk through Ephesians today. Now, strangely, um, my primary passage isn't from Ephesians. Um, I want to read it. Our, uh, uh, the title is As to the Lord, um, but this is from Colossians 3, it's uh, 23 and 24. It says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Um, so that one says as for the Lord, but the title is as to the Lord, because there's one in Ephesians that says as to the Lord. Uh, but I, I chose Colossians because uh, it, it's actually a really compact comparison passage to what we're going to do with Ephesians. So we'll be going back and forth between them. And there's a couple of principles, too, in, in understanding Scripture. You know, a lot of times we think about commentaries and things like that. But really, the first thing you should do is let the Bible comment on the Bible. And if you can do it, you let the same author comment on his own words. And so that's what this is about, is Colossians is also written by Paul. They're parallel passages, and they give us a little bit of insight, a little bit of deeper insight as we compare. And again, it's all within this context we've been talking about the biblical idea of submission, and that is placing other people first before ourselves. And we're all supposed to do that for each other. Um, so it says, as for the Lord here, but as to the Lord in, in, uh, uh, in Ephesians. And... Uh, you know, we're submitting as to the Lord, not as to the fallible person in front of us. You know, when we when we say we submit to one another, everybody we submit to is fallible in this world. Um, and, and I'm going to use a, an example from the military. I'm going to use a couple of them today. As aggravating as the military could be, some things they get right. I have a commander that I answer to, that I, I submit to. He's, pro he's probably smarter than I am. He's definitely got more experience than I do, uh, but fallible. And occasionally, I have challenged a commander. Like, I told them something that I've observed, you know, in their battalion or whatever, and there'll be that nod, and I'll think, well, nothing's going to get done. I've, I've watched this before. And so um, there, there was one time in particular, I remember, uh, I repeated myself slightly differently, came at it from a different angle. I was worried about how the soldiers were doing because of this, and then I was worried about how they were doing because of that. And um, at another point, I said, "Well, you know, in, in our NCOs, you know, we need to be keeping an eye on this and let me know as chaplain." And that, that commander said, "Got it, chaplain." <laughs> Noted, sir. I'm done. <laughs> Just needed to make sure that message was heard. Um, and, and that's oftentimes the way submission can be biblically. Is you might submit to somebody, but at the same time, you might challenge them because they're fallible, or maybe because you're advising them, or because, you know, for a variety of reasons. And last week, we talked about husbands and wives specifically. This week, we're talking about some other, uh, other relationships and other things that happen in the culture. We're going to talk about children and parents, and um, this one talks about bond servants and masters, or servants, you know, slaves and masters, depending on the translation you read. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. But it reflects submitting something of our transformation into Christ-likeness. Submit there has to do with that putting off of the old self that we talked about, which the old self is selfish, right? And it has to do with putting on the new self, which is selfless and which is being transformed into Christ-likeness. Uh, you know, I think about that old self. You know, the, there's an idea that started in the 60s. I'm sure you heard it. You got to go find yourself. Right? It's all about going and finding myself. And I think we see extreme examples of that worked out today. It's everybody's, what they think is of themselves is self-defined. It's not rooted in the transcendent. It's not rooted in God. Um, they talk about my reality kind of thinking. And there's a certain extent where that comes from the idea that nobody's in your own head. Nobody's experienced all the things that you've experienced. But there's one reality in this world. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at is... is we're being challenged to set aside the self, pick up selflessness, pick up Christ-likeness, and I want to give you the example that Christ gave. And this is a third passage from Paul. Um, bouncing around a little bit today, but it comes out of Philippians 2, and you'll recognize it. It's verses 3 through 8. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you will look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So when Paul is writing this to us, he's asking us to just be a pale reflection of what Christ himself did, and that's part of our transformation. Um, you know, and Jesus chose submission at this point. Um, and there's a big difference, I want to say this, between suffering persecution for our faith and suffering abuse in our daily relationships. You know, when we talk about submission, it's never to the point of abuse. I want to make that clear. Um, several of us have been listening to the uh, Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast. And uh, it, it's a graphic illustration of what taking it too far, um, submitting to abuse, can do to a church. Um, if you're ever interested in hearing that, I, I recommend it. Um, so I, I just want to point that out at the very beginning. You know, talk about submitting, and I think uh, one of the misrepresentations of all these passages is that people didn't submit to too much. So I always want to put that caveat out there. Uh, but I'm going to start again with Colossians, the fuller passage. And this goes back to wives and husbands uh, for a real specific reason. But it says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So, so I chose that because I want to contrast these two words. Submit is in one of them, and then obey is in the other, right? So submit leaves you your agency. You know, uh, when I submitted to my commander, I still had my own personality. If, if there was something big, you know, they talk about you can fall on your sword over, over certain things in the military. But, um, you, you know, it's your, your choice. Um, and it's then an expression of humility, and ultimately, in Ephesians, it was described as love and respect for one another. Um, so in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. So the second part, kids, it says obey. <laughs> and, and the thing about obedience is that really falls within that sort of idea of a hierarchy. Somebody has a higher position than the other. I have to obey my commander, too. Um, so in, in Jesus' case, he chose to obey, but even then, um, he chose it. He, he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He did that for a purpose. He had agency, but he still chose to place himself in the position of a servant as if he were below. Um, and when he asked that burden of what he was about to face be lifted, he, he concluded with, yet, not my will, but yours. So there's a difference, right? Children are parents, children obey. Um, there's a positional understanding there. You are to listen to what your parents have to say, and you're to do what they have to say. Uh, children obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you, and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. So that's the passage from Ephesians. And I want to give you an example of choosing positional authority. Um, I was, uh, again, this, I said this is my last uh, military example. When I went to basic training, I was the platoon guy, which, oh, lucky me, I tried to avoid it. <laughs> I, I tried to fly under the radar. So basically, um, for the whole basic training, my um, platoon, I had to keep accountability out of them. You know, I had a certain level of authority over them, but it's basic training. Nobody cares. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of pushback. <laughs> and what happened at one point was uh, about halfway through, and ours was the only platoon that they left the same platoon guy in place. Uh, I was walking down a hill. We were doing one of those uh, uh, challenge courses. I remember we had like a load, and we were having to throw our legs up over something and crawl over it. And the drill sergeant standing there, and he's looking at me. He looks at the next guy, looks at me, looks at the next guy. And that next guy was kind of one of those lazy guys who pushed back and he said, Foster, and that was the guy behind me, Foster. And he looked up, oh, you're the new platoon guy. Bowers, you get down to the bottom of the hill, you get yourself a warming beverage, it's cold. Warming beverage, that's coffee. And you tell Foster what he needs to do to be a platoon guy. And after that, they changed PGs every <coughs> few days. Like the longest one after that was maybe a week, five days, something like that. The reason they did it was because all these people had been pushing back, 
now they're getting thrown in that position and they're getting pushed back and they're starting to understand the need for people to follow and for them to follow. One of the things that we learned was the best way to become a leader is to learn to follow. And so that's what's asked of children, for parents. The best way to learn the character of your parents, the best way to learn about leading, the best way to learn about the things that you need to know in this life is to obey your parents. Now, we actually did that intentionally too, so I was a squad leader through the whole time. But that was more fun, because this was the same group of people, you know, seven or eight of us all the time. And we would go out and we would do training. And typically I would be in the lead the first time, but then after that, we'd start rotating through and let somebody else be in the lead. And it's amazing what you've learned for that, from that. Um, so those are like really good examples. You know, you let somebody lead and you even let them make bad decisions in a controlled environment. And Parents, we loosen the reins on our kids, don't we, as they get older, as they start to develop a sense of responsibility, those sorts of things. That's what it's telling us. You know, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it says to honor your father and mother. And, and that word in the Greek is to, to value, to ascribe worth to, to respect and to honor. Um, you know, and by doing that, you, you start to realize the benefit of having your parents here. You start to realize uh, the reality of, of who they are and what they do for you, you know, as far as taking responsibility uh, for you. You know, you show proper behavior and deference towards them. And it says that all may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Um, I was thinking about what this means, you know. We sometimes take that as a promise and, and sometimes um, people don't have the long life that we might expect. And, and um, that sort of thing, but that things might go well with you. You think about the child who never grows up having one respect. Do they make their lives hard for themselves? I, I know working in schools, we saw that all the time, right? Um, you'd see the kid that did learn respect, and then you'd hear about where they were a year or two later. Um, so you honor your father and mother, you learn that sort of respect, and that will serve you well in this life. It will make life much easier for you. It will make you much more productive in this life. So that it may go well with you in the land. Um, and this is fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And depending on translation, it might say exasperate. Um, there's an idea here. This one's in future tense in, in the original language. And what that means is, don't treat them in such a way that eventually, down the line, they will have been just driven into anger towards you. So fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not, it's the idea of sort of that, maybe discipline with unneeded harshness. The sort of thing that after years and years and years, as people grow up into adulthood, they look back and they have bitterness towards their parents. That's what it's telling us not to do. That's not taking away the idea that we need to discipline our children or we need to set boundaries for them. But don't exasperate your children. Or in uh, Colossians, the parallel passage, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become dis discouraged. Um, so that idea is then pushing them and pushing them and pushing them to the point where they become dis discouraged. Have you ever seen a child who... Um, they're buoyant and, and happy and, and all those other things and then at some point you know, the, the light just kind of goes out. They just are no longer interested in achieving and doing things. And that's what it's telling us not to do. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Um, it, it's really putting forward the idea of encouraging and teaching your children as opposed to something that's overly harsh. Again, there's still that need for discipline. We, we do have those passages, uh, don't spare the rod. <laughs> I don't recommend necessarily using a rod anymore. That's <laughs> uh, but, but you know, we, we have to do all those things, and yet we have to be balanced in doing it. So this is a call to fathers, maybe in particular fathers, because at this time they would have been more often the disciplinarian. Uh, so that is then mutual deference within the context of the nuclear family, right? Um, the spouses caring for one another, loving and respecting one another, children uh, being obedient, as long as we're not talking about something abusive, parents 
considering well how they're going to raise their children. And, and then it steps into this servants and masters thing, which uh, that one's always a hot button topic. I, I don't know if you know this, but liberal theologians hate Paul. They think he was a misogynist, they think he was uh, racist, they think he was uh, pro slavery, all these sorts of things, you know, uh, because he talks about and sets some boundaries here. The thing to realize is just because something is reported doesn't mean it's approved. So the times where it is talking about legitimate slavery, that doesn't necessarily mean it's approved. It was part of what was going on at the time. But if you let the Bible comment on the Bible, God's people, the Judeo-Christian tradition, usually is talking about bond servanthood, which means it's debt servitude. You, know, you didn't have a bank card where you could pay somebody on the other side of the nation, pay interest, and, and, and do all those things. Now, if you owed somebody money and you couldn't pay it off, you would have to go serve them in some capacity. So that's generally the context that you find here. But we also recognize that this was a broader Roman culture, too. Um, so there were some other things going on. But it says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Uh, so going to that whole idea of debt servitude, which was the most common thing, if you go, I did an 18 page paper in seminary on Old Testament laws and servitude. Uh, I thought about just bringing it in, print it out, and act like I was going to read it. <laughs> there would have been a rush to the door. <laughs> But what was interesting about that when I studied it was uh, a lot of those laws were intent on preserving the dignity of the debtor, of the person who owed. It was softening that servitude. They still needed to pay it off, but oftentimes what it advocated was if one of your family members owes a debt to somebody, buy off that debt and let them serve you so that their time won't be harsh. Because at that time in the Old Testament, they were particularly tribal, and, and so they didn't necessarily treat one another well. Um, there was to be no interest charged. There was to be, you know, we had that idea of, of jubilee. We had that idea of releasing people every so often. It wasn't to exceed a certain amount of time. How much nicer is that than, than uh, our current culture? And eh, we're going to charge you 20% interest until forever. Um, and, and some stranger at a bank somewhere, their whole, whole sole motive is profit. Um, so that's the idea. And it says work it out in fear and trembling. Um, and this is directed towards God, and I think, yeah, so we have a few common ideas amongst these passages. Um, when we're told to fear God, it doesn't always mean fear. I mean, if, if you're like a wicked person, yes, you should fear God, but if you are somebody like a, a fallible person in Scripture, David or Moses or you or me, fearing God means simply having reverence for God. That's really what it means. Just taking seriously who he is, and by doing so, not antagonizing him, not, not doing those, those stupid things that we're also prone to do. Um, so it says, work it out with fear and trembling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but the idea then is to work it out with uh, reverence and, and just understanding the importance of what you do before God, you know, of fulfilling your obligations. Goes on to say, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, which that's another one that's common amongst here, by way of eye service or as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, do the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to Lord and not to man, or as to the Lord and not to man. Uh, excuse me. And, and 22, let's see here, Colossians uh, verse 22, there's a parallel passage says, bond servants obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Uh, so again, there's all these different types of, of servitude, but how you live your life in these aspects of your life is, in these various aspects of, of your life, is kind of your testimony. You know, if, if you have a responsibility that you make, then keep it. There's all kinds, too, of things that we are in service to in this life. Um, I was thinking about, there's the debt thing that was often talked about, but perhaps you've signed a contract, you know, uh, maybe with an employer, and you're in service then to an employer. Um, I, I'm in service to the government, <laughs> uh, and I should work that out, you know, um, and, and, and consider how I do it and do it the right way, but not by way of eye service, doing what's pleasing. That was what I was doing with that commander. I, I knew it would be pleasing, 
you know, different. If we just had a really smooth meeting and I didn't say anything particularly prophetic, but I wanted to serve him and I wanted to protect his command. That's oftentimes the way we're supposed to be too. Uh, whatever relationship we're in, where we're bound, you know, by contract or whatever, it's part of your testimony. Uh, it, it's consistent with what God has asked of His people. Uh, remember the passage: "He who doesn't eat doesn't work." A lot of people don't think that way anymore, <laughs> but we should. And, and so we service our debts and take care of things and do what we need to. Um, don't shirk what's owed, uh, and do it with a good heart and with sincerity. You know, not as people pleasers, but with sincerity. Sincerity, feeling, fearing the Lord. And it, it says obey in everything. It must be assumed again that this is within the boundaries of your morality and your faith. I mean, you might be bound to something and eventually they push you to do. It's kind of like um, Daniel. He, he was bound, you know, to, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to pray to my God. I'm not going to pray to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, right? <laughs> I've about lost that. Some, sometimes I can't remember basic vocabulary. Oh. Uh, Knowing, let's hear, it, and it finishes knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving Christ the Lord. So receiving that inheritance, that's what we jump into next. Um, but we see that this, these themes and the meaning remains consistent across sources, across the Bible, across authors. It's a fairly consistent message. And then we can start to apply it to all kind of, kinds of contexts in our life. But we get into this whole idea of we're receiving back then from the Lord. Uh, and it says you will receive an inheritance as your reward in Colossians 24. But now jumping back into Ephesians uh, 6, 8, and 9. It says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is bondservant or is free. Masters do the same thing to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So the first idea we get there is that we will receive back from God. If we do good things, we're going to receive good from God again. It, it really expresses the idea that um, it expresses your faith in God as a just God. Sometimes you'll do good things and you won't be rewarded for it in this life. You know, you'll do good things and because we're not doing it as eye service or as people pleasers, you know, it might go unrecognized or misunderstood. But... It says, whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. If you've done good, God promises good for you. But then picking up in Colossians, it gives us the flip side of this, 325. It says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. So if somebody does wrong, again, there's faith in the justice of God. Eventually, God knows and deals with it. Um, now, does God give bad? You know, if somebody does something bad, does that mean he gives bad back in return? No, it means that he can dispense just punishment. It says they will. So whatever you do, whether good, you'll receive back good. Whether, uh, whether wrong, wrongdoer, you'll be paid back for that wrong. Uh, good or bad, God sees no distinction in social station in this life. That's worth knowing, too. Um, it, it's worth knowing for us. We're, we're probably, you know, kind of, we're mid-tier, right? We're a middle-class church, we'll call it that way. <laughs> there are people who are less fortunate than us. God doesn't see us any better than them. And there are places where you can go where it's, it's millionaires, we're thousandaires or something, maybe. <laughs> In that church, God shows no partiality. Whatever the case might be, God shows no partiality between my commander and I. God shows no partiality uh, eventually between parents and children because children grow up. Uh, no partiality, uh, but it will be paid back. And I lost my spot. Oh, yeah, the, the, the final thing here, too, is that warning against uh, masters being threatening or somebody who's in a position of power being threatening. It says that you'll receive back accordingly. And there's this admonition not to be harsh, not to be threatening, all those things. Uh, you know, it's really a commentary. Don't ever, you can't use the cross as an excuse for behaving badly. He's talking to believers at this point. If you're in a position of authority, you can't, you can't misbehave. You can't treat somebody badly and say, oh, well, God will forgive it. He's saying to work this out with fear and trembling. I think that's especially true of somebody in power over another. 
you're a steward in some respect. Um, so he says, stop your threatening, knowing that, who, that he who is both their masters and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. So it puts boundaries on your power, whether you're a parent, whether you're a banker, whether you're a husband, whether you're a master, whatever role you might have. Um, God doesn't care about those positions, and you can't inflate your importance, um, nor should you ever devalue yourself, depending on where you fall within a spectrum of you know, power dynamics and everything else. He told his disciples, he who would be first will be last. But he just like, he chooses to be last and be first. This is played out then. This is how it works out in all these different social dynamics. I'll give you three main points to finish up with. First off is simply look to yourself. Be a steward to your own behavior. That's the first thing. Be before the moat. Second is consider others first. And the final was, it will be right with you because God knows. So long as you are doing good in this life and you're doing it as unto the Lord, God knows and it will be right with you in this life. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. There have been times where I've done the right thing. And I'm like, well, this is really, really hard. <laughs> but when you recognize that God sees, it makes it so much easier. We're going to suffer slings and arrows in this life. It's not going to be perfect. But so long as you do right, God knows, and he will make you right. And we know that his kingdom will come again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these examples. And, uh, Lord, they are at times challenging, at times difficult. There's a different culture in, in the time where Paul was writing. There's different expectations, even a, an entirely different language. But what is true and, and what is noble and what is right is that we should try and have the heart that you had when you gave yourself for us. That Lord, we should aspire to being in power over one another. We shouldn't aspire to lording our power over one another, but instead we should have that heart of humility and of self-sacrifice. And in putting others first, we can build a beautiful community that expresses your love, that expresses who you are, that demonstrates the, the power of mercy and grace in our lives. And Lord, I, I pray that we take that to heart and that we take it to heart as we step out into the world, as we step out deal with employers and um, deal with our own responsibilities that, that Lord will do it with reverence towards you that will do it with a, a good heart and a clean heart and uh, Lord will do it in such a way that is a testimony to who we are as believers and in doing so that it would be a testimony for you and the transformation you made in each one of us. We thank you Lord for this upward call to put off the old self and to put on the new to be the people that you actually designed us to be. Walk with us, Lord. Work in us. Speak to us each day. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.